So oh, this is really funny. There's like a uh, song in this one. You guys know Van Halen? It's kind of like, they kind of like ripped them off. It was pretty funny. Um, so in Showstoppers, you've got the CMC. So this is, you see bottom left is uh, Scootaloo, or, or Apple Bloom, sorry. Yeah, Apple Bloom, um, which is, again, is Apple Jack's sister. Um, and then in the middle is Scootaloo, and she doesn't really like have parents, I mean, pretty much. Um, and then on the right is uh, Sweetie Belle, and that's, that's Rarity's younger sister. So that's kind of where they come from. And again, they're like all really young. So none of them have, you know, their, their cutie marks, right? Um, and so this is, this is a really big image that we're going to see develop uh, so, so, so much um, throughout the show. Um, so let's get, it, let's get it started. So they are like, remember, they're ridiculously passionate. They, they group together. So we talked about how Apple Bloom really wanted her cutie mark. These two also really want their cutie marks. So they've, they've kind of come together under a, a mastermind, under a friendship, under a movement. And they've said, look, you know what? We are going to get our cutie marks together as a team because they realize the power of the group. And they understand that they can do so much more as a team than they ever could hope to as an individual and so they're trying so 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 many things to get you know their cutie mark they're trying a ton of different things as as a team as a group and as they do this they're also developing very strong relationships with each other and developing a bond um, this is so powerful like if you have like because they have this goal right this goal is this cutie marks right it, this goal could be anything okay make this you know whatever your goal is XYZ doesn't matter all three share the same goal in a business, same thing. All of the C-suite executives in any corporate team want the company to create more value for shareholders, create more revenue, increase profits, whatever. Like that's their goal. They all have the same goal. And to get there, there's obviously, you know, we talked about a C, the next logical step to get there. But it is so much easier to do it as a team than it is to just try to do this one at a time, at a time, at a time. Because you don't have, you know, every single strength that you could need on this path. You might only have one or maybe you have two. And so as you work as a team, remember, you're going to get those peak strengths of everybody working as a collective unit. So you have, you know, like a whole ball um, and then the ball rolls and it rolls and it rolls and it rolls rather than you trying to fill every single hole and do everything yourself. It's just not um, going to work. And so, oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. So like think about it with, with these three. They all have their ideas for what they want to do. And they know that they've got to you know, chow through tons and, and tons of activities and just random stuff over and over again so that they can get to this goal. Like the next logical step for them is to just do things over and over and over again. And so they do it as a group. They do it as a team. And the biggest, biggest thing for them is that if they're doing this on their own, or if they were maybe doing this with just a family member or something. Like they would be, we talked about, you know, the principles curve earlier, this idea that you're going up and then you have down and then you go up and then you go. So you have, you have higher lows, right? You're going up over time. If they're just doing this by themselves and they don't have, you know, these friendships right here that are getting stronger and stronger and stronger over time. Okay, if they're just doing it by themselves, and they're just here all alone. And maybe they try, uh, they try canoeing, right? And when they try canoeing, you know, it oh, looks pretty fun, looks pretty fun, but ah, oh my God, we crashed, we fell off a waterfall, I don't like canoeing. And then they go down to ground zero. And then you try zip lining, try zip lining, oh, oh, zip lining, oh, he fell down and you go down to ground zero. Try kayaking, oh, let's go kayaking, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, fell down, go to ground zero. No progress here. Uh, they might have, you know, incremental progress, like out of the 10,000 things that you could do for a career, you learn that you don't like, you know, coding Python, or you learn that you don't like managing people. Okay, well, maybe there's just a little bit of growth, a little bit of growth, just a little bit. But think about it like this, now that these guys have a team, not only are they getting the basics out of the way, you know, I don't like this, or I like this, or I'm, you know, whatever the goal is, whatever they're working through, whatever tasks that they're doing, not only are they getting that done, but more importantly, 
they're developing connections and relationships with each other. And those relationships and those connections are what underpin all of this growth. It's not necessarily the things that they do. It's just the fact that they do it together. Okay? And as soon as they do you know, enough things together, and you'll see, the, you'll see them grow. They do a whole lot throughout the rest of the show. But it's so, so important to understand this concept that if you're working towards something, you're building a, a pathway with other people, even if it fails, even if you just slump down every single time for 10 times in a row, like if you did it by yourself, sure, you, know, you would have a little bit of growth. But when you do it as a team, it's geometrically faster because now you can work as a team focusing on what you're really, really good at, right? So that you get better at this part and you don't have to get better at the parts you're bad at, but the people that are good at those parts get better at those parts. And so now they're able to build a much greater, like a mastermind, right? This idea that all three of them, you know, this is one, this is like Sweetie Belle, Apple Bloom, Scootaloo, they're all contributing to this mastermind. And this mastermind has a ridiculously greater amount of power if they work on it, if they work to grow it. It can be so much greater than any one of them can individually be because it multiplies not only like their physical presence, like yes, three people can do more than one person, but more importantly, it's geometrically scaling their mental growth and development and what they're actually learning, not only about themselves, but about the fundamental skills and techniques that they can use for success in the marketplace. Because this mastermind can connect with um, the subconscious, right? It can connect with their maybe ideas they wouldn't necessarily have at once, they wouldn't necessarily think of if they were just writing down a big list of ideas. But because they can focus on, you know, everyone's subconscious, everyone's inner thoughts that maybe aren't necessarily stated, but they'll flow together in this mastermind. It creates so much creativity and so many results um, that like, you know, people competing on their own, they just they are light years behind what this team can do together because They've gone through this process. They've gone through the social growth. They've gone through the development. And they're working towards building relationships that will last the rest of their lives as long as it's kind of like a pinwheel, right? Um, if you look how they're building their relationships, it's a lot of work at first, but then it, it's, it's, it stays up there, right? This is like the strength of the relationship, the strength of the mastermind. Like it's going to be very, very powerful right after they do something huge. And all they have to do now is just do a little bit more to sustain it, a little bit to sustain it, um, and just keep going over and over again because it never falls too low. It always stays here. As long as they keep working to maintain it, this mental power, this mastermind is going to stay a re because, yeah, it'll stay a reality and it'll allow them to output significantly more in the work that they do and achieve uh, a ton more than they would be able to do alone. So please, please, please work with other people and build relationships with them to have significantly higher success with it. Um, okay, cool, cool, cool. So here's where we start to see kind of relationships like tactically have an impact, uh, which is pretty cool. It's called Dog and a Pony Show, but um, basically Rarity and Spike go to uh, this, this land. It's, it's kind of like no one really, it's just far away from um, Ponyville. And they're going to collect gems for Rarity because when she, uh, you know, knits or, or you know, makes dresses, um, she uses these gems and then the gems, um, you know, she weaves them into the fabric and they look really, really nice. And so she has to kind of go out and collect them every once in a while or, or buy them or whatever. So she goes to this land where all the gems are and they're just collecting gems. And the problem is, these uh, guys called the Diamond Dogs show up, and you can you can see them. They're like big, beefy guys, um, and they they you know you can see they're like got a big uh, spear, I guess. Um, but you know, Rarity and Spike, they're just minding their business, doing their thing, collecting these gems, 
And these guys, they just kind of like pop up out of the ground and um, just kind of like, they're like really big and they have weapons. So they sort of just overtake them. Um, and so they capture rarity because like, it's like their goal, I guess. Um, and then Spike kind of runs away and he goes back home to get help. And so, you know, his goal, right, is to like help save his friend, right? Um, so you kind of see they're in a cave. So they go underground and they take her underground with them and just kind of like force her to like work or do crap that she doesn't want to do. <laughs> and um, what's interesting is like, at the beginning, she realizes that like she's got to figure out a way out of here, and these guys, you know, they're not uh, the best people. And so what she does is she starts to be like super annoying, right, and just mess up these guys' day in any way uh, possible to have like the biggest impact that she can have uh, in this place because she's like just freaking out. She again, she hates dirt, so like being in a cave is like detrimental to her um, and it's one of like her biggest you know pain points and it, it's crushing her on the inside to be in this, this situation but she's okay with it she's pushing through with it and she realizes that you know to really save herself she's got to stand up she's got to level up and this is a situation that some people go through right this idea that like you've got to become more you got to be more than where you are right now what you're doing right now and where you're at and really the best way to do that is to be in a, a pressure, right? So this situation, it puts on the pressure. Um, and it's, it's huge, this idea that the pressure comes only when you're, you're crunched into your, your tightest hour. Um, I know like when I was getting like my first minimum wage job at Subway, like before that, I had to like lose, I was like super fat, right? I lost like 50 pounds in like a couple, like half a year. And for me, like the, the only reason that happened, the only reason I was able to become more and to change who I was and to shift my whole paradigm on health was because like my parents got divorced, right? And so that divorce was a point of pressure. And that point of pressure fundamentally shifts your viewpoint on what you need to do. I realized, you know, for me, like I had to become the man of the house. For Rarity, she had to become a, a freer of herself. She had to scale up and fundamentally shift. Like she's never been in a situation like this before. All she's done her whole life is sew and make dresses. And so this is a whole new side to her, a whole new world to her um, that only comes from a point of pressure. Exact same thing for me, like it only shift uh, that, that really got me to that point. Health and you know, my first job um, was because of that pressure. And like uh, you guys might, you know, Billy Joel, um, he, he's got a song called Pressure, and that song, insane. Why is it insane? Because it puts you in a state of fear of like, you know, the only way you're going to ever be more is to start in a position where you're scared. Um, and for her, she's scared. Where she, like, you want to force yourself to be scared of being trapped where you are. So Spike um, goes home and he grabs everyone, and he wants to be like the knight in shining armor and uh, save everybody, uh, which is totally cool makes sense um that's what he like wants to do um unfortunately that doesn't uh, really happen so he goes home and he's like you know the big beefy guy and he's supposed to like save the girl or whatever um but he brings back his friends and he's like hey let's all go save her and what happened is really cool is like rarity she became more she was able to basically piss these guys off so much and mess with them so much that they like just wanted to let her go because she was so annoying to them and she was crushing them. You guys know the, the paradigm of like the prisoner who becomes so annoying that the captors let her go. Uh, it's the exact same thing that she did here. Uh, she just pissed these guys off a bunch and they let her go, they let her go out. And that only happened because she's able to change her state. So everyone gets here and you know, this guy thinks he's gonna be like the knight in shining armor and save the day, uh, but it just doesn't happen. And she escapes on her own and proves that like, you don't have to be like, you know, a, a 20 foot dragon to just take care of your own situations. And this um, comes up a lot, you know, in day to day life, but kind of more importantly, uh, at least for me, like, like when you're starting up something where you really want to connect with people 
and you want to have an impact with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis to get things done in their lives, um, you kind of have to overcome this initial hurdle of, you know, can you and you alone do this? And a lot of the time people fail and they, they say no and they crash. And the best way to stop yourself from crashing and to go to that next level of success, to go to that next level of impact and that purpose of fulfillment in your life is really, really, really just to get to this ground level. Focus on you know being way up here, right? So her goal was to get out of here and use pressure constantly. It's like a high performance thing, but I mean, if you can use pressure as a way to push you and goals as a way to pull you, it's gonna geometrically increase the results that you get and exponentially decrease the amount of time it takes to create those results by putting yourself in a constant state of productivity and output in the marketplace. It's really, really cool stuff. So the biggest thing with pressure to push you and, and goals to pull you um, is it first starts with having like a long-term goal, okay? Um, this is like that 10-year goal that we talked about, like with the QD Mark Crusaders, like they're focusing on getting to that huge, huge, huge 10-year goal. Um, or whatever the big goal is in your life. And as soon as you have that long-term goal, maybe you're down here and you gotta take the next logical step to get there. So with pressure, like the best way to put pressure on yourself, there's like two really, really, really good ways. The first way is with deadlines, right? So like, um, really great example. So I was writing my first like novel. I had a writing deadline and I said, I have to get this done by Christmas Eve. And so I got it done by Christmas Eve. Like there was no if buts about it, like letter gold, like the great example of this, um, this idea that like, you know, they had these, um, these politicians in Cuba, right? And these politicians will constantly be threatened by the mob and the gang and to, to pass laws that allow them to basically like deal drugs and do illegal stuff. And so what they'll do is they'll bribe the politicians to let them keep the laws the way they are so that they can keep doing business. And if the politicians have a bill that's going through and it's not a favorable one, what they'll do is they'll sneak into their house at night and they'll hold a gun to their head and say, look, you either cut this bill and take this bag of gold or take you know, the lead and, and die. And so like, when you've got a gun to your head with your letter gold deadline, you wanna say, look, you're, I'm either like, like, you have to think that if this deadline passes and you don't get what you want done, like you're dead, like you're crushed. So you have to have a very, very specific goal due on a very, very specific deadline. Like pick a day, any day, and like that has to be the day that it gets done. Um, and you can make it happen. Uh, another great example in a little bit of a shorter term instead of like a year. Um, I remember I was doing this big science project, right? Like the science project was for like the scholarship thing and it was doing like um, uh, a week. It was doing a week. I had to get a team together. We got like five, six people together. Got six people together because I couldn't do the freaking thing by myself. We had our one goal was to do this science project. And our deadline like was hard set at midnight. Like we either submit the project on Friday at midnight or we couldn't enter the competition. So very, very specific goal, very, very specific deadline. That puts a lot of pressure on you. Like you have to perform, you have to meet this deadline or you're screwed. Um, so that's, probably, that's the first part. The second part is uh, using music. Like music is such an integral part uh, of my life. I, I really love a Canadian label called Monster Cat. Um, and like just find like a song that when you hear it, it, it just brings you into a state of a little bit of pressure, but more importantly, a little bit of productivity. And you wanna be sort of in that sweet spot between pressure and productivity. And then like, and this is a really weird habit, but like 45% of millionaires or some crap like that, like have this habit. And you just listen to the same song over and over and over again on repeat, like while you're working. And this has worked wonders for me. It's, it's insane. Um, and it's just finding music that pushes you. Uh, like I, I make computers, I build PCs for clients. And when I, when I build PCs, I, I need to get them done pretty quickly. I got shit to do. And it takes like eight hours. Like it, they're like custom rigs. They're, it takes a long time. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll get Billy Joel, I'll play Billy Joel's Pressure, like literally over and over and over for eight hours. And I have a very specific deadline, which is the end of the day. I have a very specific piece of music I'll play over and over and over again to push me to that deadline, while the deadline you know, also kind of pushes me. And the goal, the goal is of getting it done, pulls. Um, and the goal has to be something big, like 
really big. Like, what do you really want to achieve? And the way you figure out what that goal is is by doing things over and over, just doing a bunch of things, going through that process. Um, but yeah, music is really powerful, really cool, cool stuff. Um, green isn't your color. So this is pretty funny. So this, um, there's like a photographer. Okay, so the photographer comes into town and says that they're going to have like a photo shoot. Okay, so they decide um, that there's going to be like this big photo shoot and it's going to be a, a huge, a huge party. Um, and Rarity, you know, she's like the dress girl. She is like super into um, publicity and, and photos. Like this is what she really, really wants to do with, with her life. And so, so we'll say this is like the stage, okay? And this is where Rarity wants to be. And then there's this photo, this pony um, flash fin uh, photo finish and she's taking everybody's picture. She's like German and she sounds like, ah! She just screams at everybody. She's so fun. And like Rarity really, really wants to be on this stage with her dresses, um, getting all of her pictures taken and getting in like these huge magazines. Uh, cause, and she wants to like be the model, right? That's her goal. And <laughs> so you can see Fluttershy in the picture. So Fluttershy comes in and she just, she doesn't want any of this. She is, remember, she likes animals. She's not into you know, fashion or, or photos or modeling. She couldn't care less. Um, and so Photo Finish comes to town. Photo Finish, she's Rarity, says hi to Rarity. She's you know, making dresses. She's like, oh, that's cool. Then she sees Fluttershy and says, oh my God, Fluttershy is the coolest pony on the planet, right? Um, <laughs> whatever. And takes him Fluttershy and just like adores, it's, it's ridiculous. And puts dress on her, puts her on the runway. And she's just so excited. She thinks she looks amazing, like 10 out of 10. And she's like super pumped about it. And she's got like you know, five camera guys following her. Like she's a big deal. And she's taking all these pictures of, of Fluttershy. And Fluttershy is like, she's super shy, right? So she is, she's like not too happy about it. She's like, dude, what the heck, right? She is not a big fan of being a model, being popular. It's just not her thing. But Rarity, on the other hand, she's like super jealous because like she wants this so bad. And this is um, like, the, like the two emotions that are just detrimental. A je a jealousy and, um, and anger. These, these two. Just, oh, oh my God. So with jealousy, this is, this is what Rarity's feeling. Like they've literally done like labs and they have rats, right? And these rats, they're like fed human spit. Um, and I'm not gonna get too much in technicals, we don't have too much time, but like the emotions that you have in your head have an impact on like your body, right? They, it physically impacts you and it changes your, your DNA, right? So if you spit, like your spit's different if you're pissed off or you're jealous versus if you're like ridiculously happy. And there's a whole bunch of science behind that. Um, but what they did is, is they fed like angry and jealous spit to rats and it literally poisoned them with enough of it. It actually killed the rats uh, because jealousy and anger were the two emotions that fundamentally altered um, the physiology of the human body to the extent that it, it like literally the DNA changed and was actually poisonous. So, so that's, that's, that's what we're getting at here is that, like this angry state, this, is poisonous. This is like breaking down her, her ability to make decisions, her ability to survive, her ability to live is being destroyed. And so often, some people get angry or jealous all the time. Like it's literally killing them. Um, and so she gets really upset. And because she wants to be, you know, in this um, picture, she wants to be in this event. And so Fluttershy, she's like the opposite. She doesn't want to do this. And the only reason that she is doing it is because she thinks in her head that Rarity wants her to do it and that she's making Rarity happy by being a model for, these are Rarity's dresses, so she's modeling Rarity's dresses. Um, and so that's, that's like the only thing that makes her happy. So photo finish, you know, she's just doing her thing. And what happens is, is Fluttershy, she keeps going, she keeps modeling, but she's like really getting tired of it. And so it gets to the point like towards the end, right? She is like, she's finishing up, she's done. She's like, look, I really don't want to do this. And so she tells Spike. So Spike comes in and Rarity tells Spike how she feels. And then Fluttershy tells Spike how she feels. And 
Spike realized this is it, like this is a freaking problem. And the only problem is he promised Fluttershy that he wouldn't tell Rarity how she felt or about you know modeling, how she really wasn't happy with it. And so Spike, you know, he he stayed true to his word, and he didn't you know blurb about it to uh, Rarity because Fluttershy didn't want him to. And but what he does is he, he tries to get these two together, right? He tries to push them together, and so they come together on this stage, and Fluttershy is so tired of it. She's been putting up this act for her friend, and she's been going through you know the process of all this photo shoot just to make her friend happy. And she is like just, oh my God, so sick of it. And she says, look, I can't let this happen anymore. I can't do this anymore. I hate it. And Rarity is like, oh my God, no way. I hated you doing it because I wanted to do it. That's insane. And so they have this epiphany together that they should switch places. And the only reason they have that epiphany, the only reason that they actually solved this problem was because of accidentally telling the truth. And this is why it's so important to tell the truth and to be radically transparent with your relationships, uh, transparent, with your businesses, with, with the work that you do. You want to be so clear, so open with the people that you work with that they know when this is going on and it gets rid of jealousy, it gets rid of anger. And it allows you guys to work together towards the truth, towards the better future, because you know what you want to happen. And when two people know each other's goals, it sounds really crazy. And this is something that uh, it took me a while to get. Um, if you tell somebody like, hey, can I, can I skip your, your place in line at the urinal or something? Um, like I, used to run, I run construction, right? So if I ask someone, hey, can I skip uh, your, your spot in line for the, for the portage on? Um, they're gonna like most people are gonna be like no but if you give them a reason and you be transparent you say look my race starts in five minutes and we're about to run like you know a 5k i really got to go to the bathroom um can i please skip you like you give them a reason it, it, a lot of times people will help you out right um quick tip never pee before the race it's not a good strategy um but anyway so be transparent with the people you work with and the people you want to you know, really do business with, but also just create relationships with. And you won't get stuck in a crap situation like this where you're doing what you don't want to do uh, in, in an environment that's just detrimental to the environment, the relationship, and the workplace. Cool. So over a barrel. So we go to a new place in this episode. So if we've got like, you know, Ponyville's kind of over here and then Canterlot's kind of over here, um, we kind of take a train and we go all the way over here to a new place called Appaloosa. Anyway, go to Appaloosa and we meet some new people. This is like basically all apples. Um, so this is like a lot of Applejack's family and um, they're distant cousins and where he, she you know, came from, where her family's from. And what's interesting about Appaloosa is they kind of split, their town sort of split. So on one side, you have like all these buildings, you can kind of see um, the railroad. So the railroad comes in um, and there's like a whole town. They've got like a general mill. It's kind of like an old, you know, Western town village. And you know, they've got horses, whatever, and they're hay, farming. And their main, you know, business, the crops, uh, it's farming, right? So they have apple trees like all over the place. And that's really what they, uh, what they do is they just have apple trees everywhere. And on the other side of this you know, line is uh, a whole bunch of buffalo. Um, and it's like, <laughs> it's, yeah, so a buffalo. So you got a ton, a ton of buffalo over here and a ton of ponies over here. And the problem is the buffalo, they just kind of stampede everywhere and just go berserk. And unlike you know the ponies that are like planning things and planning for the future, and really trying to sort of get stuff done um, and have a productive growing civilization. The buffalo, I mean, they're just buffalo. So they're just kind of doing their own thing and going everywhere, eating whatever they can eat and having uh, just big mass movements everywhere. Kind of like hunter gatherers, you know, the difference between like hunter gatherers and farmers. Um, that's pretty much what's going on here. And so Applejack comes here and the, the problem is like, there's a huge conflict between the two. Um, because these guys are like running all over the orchard, right? And they're destroying the trees. Uh, and their gripe with it is that like this, you know, this was their land. 
Um, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like the Indian movement, right? Like, like this was their land. This is where they lived for you know ages, and they just stampede everywhere all the time. And so you have like a, a big difference in actual like social norms, right? It's the idea that like you know people versus these animals, and it's just totally different. And because it's totally different, they have like wholly different ways of looking at life. They're literally like different species of, of being. Um, they, they do things differently, right? And so there's a huge conflict that comes together at this border right here where, you know, the apples are trying to have like a normal town and these guys just want to trample over everything and have tons of, you know, running everywhere. Um, and so when this, when this difference comes in and these guys, they have to really you know, figure out what to do or else they're going to destroy each other, which is a serious problem. You can see them right now. They're like hunkering over like barricades of hay, getting ready for a war with these buffalo. They have like a ton of pies and they're like, you know, guns. They can't really have guns in a kid's show. So they're going to like throw these pies at them and they're supposed to like knock them off their feet and make them fall over and, you know, quote, quote, die, whatever. Um, and it, like it's pretty violent like they're pretty intense <laughs> and the reason that they're intense is because they have no clue how to connect with each other they don't speak to each other all they do is conflict and fight and if there's an incident it's instant blame it's instant shift in perspective like they're just like you know crush them buffalo bad these guys are hurting our lands and destroying our things and they never really sit down and talk and say well what makes sense here they never step back and say how can we like actually work this out and i mean because the buffalo you know they talk so like they can talk but they never take the chance to understand each other um and you know like if someone comes across the street and spits in your face like you're gonna get pretty pissed and you're gonna have conflict really 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 quickly like that makes sense like you 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 get mad at people if they spit in your face um you're not gonna sit there and ask well what's going on what's the conflict that we have like you don't care you know like they could be having the worst day ever like it doesn't matter you're gonna get pissed at them and, and like i mean probably like punch them or something um, but if it happens day after day after day after day over and over and over which is exactly what's happening here like there's something deeper going on here. There's a deeper disconnect and you've got to like realize that first of all, but more importantly, like embrace it. You know, it doesn't take a whole lot of work to just come and, and sit down with, you know, the chief of the Buffalo talks to, to Brayburn, the chief of, you know, all these guys, he's the leader of the town. Like Brayburn can come and just talk to the Buffalo chief and figure out where the problem is so they can work together to grow their communities. Um, and that's sort of like exactly what needs to happen. But so often it's not necessarily the easiest answer, right? Like it's super easy to just sit back and fight whenever fights come up and then not worry about it when there aren't any fights. Um, but what's that mean? Well, first of all, it means that all of these crops are going to get like they're constantly destroyed. And so it's literally crushing both their economic output and more importantly, like their only food source. Um, and then like it just crushes their ability to grow right because if they try to move into this land they're going to be instantly pushed back because these guys think they're invading or they're having a war fighting um so you got to step back and it's a, it's that thing with ego right you have to take a temporary dip in ego a temporary dip in your reputation and say look i'm willing to sacrifice you know i'm not right admit that you need help from this other group um, and as soon as you can do that, as soon as you can take this temporary sacrifice and say, look, I'm not perfect. We need to work something out here. So this is not a good situation. Let's try to work towards a better future. It's going to suck at the beginning, but after you put in that initial work to get it done, um, and that, that's exactly what happens. It, it just fundamentally shifts the way that, that these guys function because they realize, you know, they, they start to talk and they start to grow together and and the buffalo learn how to connect with the ponies and they learn that the buffalo just want to run around everywhere and they find that there's like a big empty field over here where they can run around and so everybody's happy they can still grow and they can still have their um you know their, their trees growing and make the actual product that they need to live 
and thrive because they come into like a synergy with um, this other social group. And it all stems, all of the connection, all of the peace, all of the unity stems from taking a minute, saying you're wrong, and asking someone for help so that you can grow together and bridge this gap, bridge these norms, and connect the two social groups. Really powerful stuff. Big, 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 big game changer. So Fluttershy is really, really good with animals. So um, Celestia gives Fluttershy philonoma and basically says, hey, I'm going out of town. Can you take care of this bird for the next week or so? Um, and Fluttershy is like, sure, sure, sure. So she has all her feathers and she's like this big, bright red bird. Um, she's like pretty fat and ugly, but she's got her feathers at least, right? Um, and so Fluttershy takes her in and she just kind of like feeds her like, you know, you would feed a bird. Um, but the problem is after a couple of days go by, like Philonoma kind of starts to lose her feathers. And more importantly, she, um, like if this was like Philonoma's health, okay? She started out like pretty solid and pretty solid. And then she loses her feathers and she starts to lose her more and more and more and more feathers. And then she gets sick and then she gets like ridiculously sick. Um, and she starts to cough and, and just like her neck like explodes. Like she looks like she's dying. It's pretty bad. Um, and over the next like week, right? Um, Philonoma is like, she's just dying. It's insane. Um, and so she, Fluttershy, you know, tries to give Philonoma medicine, uh, tries to give him, you know, anything that would make him not die. Cream, moisturizer, um, tries to like tape feathers back onto him, totally doesn't work. So he loses like all of his hair and like totally over exaggerates himself basically like dying. And it's, it's pretty cynical. Um, but the bird, like, the bird's like a bird, right? So, like, it can think and it, it has, like, a head. And it knows that, like, he's, like, really messing with Fluttershy. Because um, he's, like, super over-exaggerating his pain. Um, just, like, by the way they animate it, you can sort of tell. Um, so, it gets to the point where, like, it's so bad, she has no clue what to do. So, she puts him in a cage and, you know, takes him to the vet to figure out what's going on. And the vet, like, the vet has no clue. She's like, this guy is this just terrible, terrible, terrible health, terrible condition. It's just awful. Um, and then it gets to the point where, remember, there's a hard deadline, right? So, this is kind of when, you know, Celestia is coming back and... Um, and she's got to give the bird back to Celestia. And so she starts to get really close to this deadline and she's freaking out because she wants this bird to be healthy and you know not like completely dead because that's how Celestia gave it to her. And so she starts to kind of run around town and hide around town and make up excuses and reasons why she can't meet Celestia. She hides from her home. She runs away from you know her, her friends, people she's working with. She just gets out of the position, out of the world, and tries to run away from it. Um, and as you guys know, running away from something, it's not really uh, a suitable answer. It's not going to save the day. Um, and it's just a shortcut to say, try to like, get to that end result. But eventually, you know, Celestia finds Fluttershy. She finds Philonoma, and she's like, oh, whoa right um she's like so fluttershy like kind of hid the bird um and then met celestia and said hey and celestia's like hey where's my bird and she's like oh let me go get your bird and then she picks out philonoma from where like her cage was and philonoma like flies into the air lands on a fountain um is <laughs> is pretty violent um but like so basically the bird is like so, like she's on the fountain and um, this is like Fluttershy, and, and this is Celestia, who's taller than Fluttershy. And this is Philonoma, and, um, and she basically just explodes and bursts into fire and flames and dies. And like her ashes crumble down the side of this fountain, and she she's just explodes into death. Um, and her ashes kind of fall down here. And like Celestia, uh, Fluttershy, She's freaking out. Like, she's like, holy crap, what just happened, right? Um, but Celestia's chilling out. Why is she chilling out? Why does she care? 
She doesn't care because she has something that the Fluttershy doesn't have. She has knowledge, okay? See, the, the problem is you can only do what you know. You know, like if I want to go and construct a building, you know, uh, and I want to like design the plans for the posts and then figure out how many beams I need and figure out where all the nails need to go and where the support brackets need to be. Like I can only do what I know. Same thing, like if you want to go, you know, build a car, okay? Like you can only do what you know. Fluttershy has never seen an animal like Philanova before and she just doesn't know about it. Um, but Celestia, like obviously this is Celestia's bird. And so she knows something that Fluttershy doesn't know. Well, what does she know? She walks over to uh, the pile of ash and she picks up the pile of ash and she says, come on, Philanoma, what are you doing? Um, and, Philano and so the pile of ash like magically turns into this giant like sparrow bird um, that's like majestic. It's like blazing orange, amber, colors everywhere. Um, and it's a phoenix, right? So it was, it's, it's burst into this huge, 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 huge phoenix. And Celestia knew like Philanova was a phoenix. And so what happens is huge, 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 huge. It starts off as just a normal bird and then it has to go through this, this condensed period of time in its life, right? So this is like the average period of time in its life. It goes through this condensed period of time, kind of like, you know, a worm uh, becoming a caterpillar going into a, or, yeah, like a caterpillar goes into a cocoon, becomes uh, a butterfly. Same thing with um, the, uh, with Philanova, right? Goes through a very condensed period of death and decay, which is what Fluttershy had her for. And then it becomes this beautiful phoenix. Um, and it soars through the sky and it's majestic and it's amazing. If you don't know that, you're freaking out. If you know that, you don't care. So learn the knowledge that's applicable and that's gonna let you kind of get through the tough time here so that you know it's just part of the process. Part, you know, one, two, three, just part of the three-step process of growth. Because once you know what the process is before you go into it, it's so much easier. Like if you spend 10% of your time learning the process of something before you jump into it, it's so much easier to actually go through the whole thing. Um, great example, I teach people how to invest. If you, if you can learn the investing process before you go into it, it's so much easier when you get to like this tough part right here where there's like a serious growth change. Um, excuse me, it looks like there's a lot of failure. It's just part of the process. Um, and then obviously also the idea that like a vast majority of your results, uh, especially if you're working with like a tech thing or a new idea or a startup or a company, like most of your results are going to come very, very, very quickly after you've put in a bulk of the effort before that point. So if you spend like, you know, a year making like a software or an app or something, writing a book, whatever, like a vast majority of the results are going to come very, very quickly as soon as you start to sell whatever you make or whatever it is that you do. Um, or same thing, right? Like if you spend, you know, four years in college and, you know, you're working like minimum wage jobs and then you get out of college and you get like a super high paying, you know, job or a career or whatever, like a vast majority of the results come after this big decay very, very, very quickly. Um, so that's just kind of a mindset shift to have with the way you look at value propositions and creating that value in reality. And this is what it looks like kind of like when um, she saw the dead bird in her hands, which was pretty, pretty brutal. And then that's the beautiful phoenix.